Okay, um, Mike, we've thinned it out to a, an acceptable number of people here, which is nice. We're not so crowded that we have to breathe each other's carbon carbon monoxide or whatever comes out, carbon dioxide. And um, my name is Curtis Whitson, and uh, I'll be doing kind of the second part of the of this seminar. And Mike has uh, spent a lot of time on the real physics and engineering of of um, petroleum system, um, and introduced uh, through that simple problems that illustrate how Excel um, can be used to do optimization. And the um, the next two days, what we're going to do is is uh, deviate a little bit from that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about real, uh, real physics and engineering. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bring a problem uh, into the class today and and tomorrow. We'll revisit the the uh, uh, the five well problem in in an expanded size, 60 wells with I think six separators, uh, to talk a little more about these optimization issues that. Bjarna has tried to um, to help us understand, but I'm going to look at that 60 well problem in a little bit different light. I'm going to look at it as an engineer who doesn't understand, who doesn't carry a Bjarna Fulse in his back pocket, okay? And we're going to look at some of the strategies that you can that you as an engineer through some uh, common sense engineering, some understanding of the mathematics. Can, can take a tool like Solver that has nonlinear and linear solvers and, and, and it's really a very complex uh, solution environment and, and use that intelligently to solve problems. Um, <clears throat> so, but the main emphasis that I want to have today and, and tomorrow is to talk about a topic that is not really addressed in the current curricula at the university here in Trondheim and really probably not anywhere around the world. And that has to do with um, the integration of modeling, okay? The integration of modeling in a upstream to downstream in a petroleum environment. Meaning that today, uh, the students here, third year, decide that they want to be a reservoir engineer, a production engineer, a drilling engineer, and if you're in chemical engineering, you become a process engineer. And you basically spend the rest of your life doing reservoir engineering, at least until the company says that now you're a production engineer, you have to do production engineering, okay? So we work in, in basically discipline-specific environments, and we use discipline-specific models or tools. Reservoir simulator, Prosper, HISIS, okay? Or an Excel sheet that does the same kind of calculation, but in a simplified manner. But what we generally do is that we we work on solving discipline-specific problems, and we become experts at that, okay? What I want to try to talk about is the idea of taking those models that these specialist groups build, okay? The reservoir engineers that have field A, and the reservoir engineers that have field B, and the reservoir engineers that have field C. To take those three models for reservoirs A, B, and C, which are separate data sets, they could even be separate reservoir simulators, okay? And to get those three reservoir engineering groups to actually interact and work together, not in a team building environment, not in a seminar, not in the mountains of Norway, not on a boat, but where they're actually their three models, A, B, and C, are running simultaneously in a computational environment where if there is interaction between reservoirs A, B, and C models, that you feel that interaction and there, there's some communication of the three models as, as you're simulating the different three reservoirs. That, in fact, is done very, very seldom today in today's environment. And that's typically because the reservoir A model takes three hours or 30 hours to run a single case. And 
the complications and the the slowdown is not that if each model takes 10 hours to run and you run them three, you say, I've got three processors, I'll run them at the same time. It takes 10 hours. It's not that simple because the orchestration of getting those three models to run simultaneously and to interact is not something that's basically done today in the industry. And that's integration of just the reservoir discipline. Okay? Just the reservoir discipline. These guys and gals, they can talk to each other. They're probably using the same reservoir simulator. They, they, they understand each other. They probably even play volleyball together. Okay? But, but they don't do this integration of their models. And the question is, why not? And if, if they're going to do it, what are the requirements to do that? So, so that's integration, in a sense, at a given discipline. But what we're talking about, and we're going to try to talk about here and, and, and today and tomorrow, is the integration, not just, what would you call that, at one discipline, but to integrate the various disciplines. The reservoir engineers are passing streams of gas, oil, water, maybe methane concentrations in kilo, kilo, kilo moles per, per, per day, passing that downstream. And those streams are passing through what? Pipelines right? Through pipelines. And the pipeline engineers, uh, of course, pipeline engineering in the design phase, they do lots and lots of simulations for different cases. Once they put the pipelines into the, into the field development, they may, may become fixed. And the only thing that you can alter as a function of time is what Mike talked about yesterday, the routing. Okay? You may have some flexibility on the routing. But the modeling of the pipeline system is directly affected by what these three different reservoirs is passing into the pipeline as a function of time. Okay? And if you change the routing, it's going to change the pressure drops in the various pipelines and gathering systems. And then you get the pipelines delivering the gas, oil, and water where? To the process facilities. There might be six in a field. There might be one major one. There might be two or three. There might be many different processing facilities, local and then maybe field-wide. And all of those calculations that, that if you took my course, the flash calculations to do the, separator, uh, the separator calculations to take compositional streams and break it into various products, that has to be done by a model, a HISIS model, an Excel flash calculation model, uh, or some other model. Okay, And it requires an equation of state or a k-value correlation to create the products. And then once we get the products, what do we do with the products? Okay, we put those products in a new pipe set of pipelines or we might transport it off and it ships off to a refinery. Okay, or the transport goes somewhere else. Or maybe some of the gas is being re-injected okay, into the reservoir. So you get a, a feedback, uh, a looping feedback that what's produced from the reservoir, processed from the reservoir, is then sent back into the reservoir. And the composition of that gas, you don't know that in the reservoir simulation model unless you put a processing facility in the reservoir simulator. And the processing capabilities in a reservoir simulator varies from a very simplistic, you know, multi-stage separator uh, to a few reservoir simulators that actually have quite complex surface processing capabilities. So the feedback from the process group to the reservoir group and, and so forth and so on. So it's the integration of these different models that are doing calculations for the different disciplines. But trying to do that orchestration of the modeling, the interaction of the models, the influence of the results of one model on another model, and so forth, that's the topic of what, what I want to try to talk about today. Because we don't do that kind of integrated modeling in, in the industry. Okay. Now, one of the reasons is the is computational requirements. The other reason is this: the communication between the models. There's not a clear communication line of how to send data from one model to the next model. They use different formats, different file, different uh, protocols for getting the information. They need different information. What one model gives is not adequate to generate the next model uh, launch. So you have all sorts of uh, problems and issues related to integration of models. And we'll try to talk about some of those. 
um, issues. We're not going to solve all the problems here today, but we're going to at least start thinking about what are the challenges of integrating uh, models. Okay. Now, let's move on to the future where we're actually able to integrate some models. You know, the three reservoirs get together, they integrate the models, they get them to launch and march together. They integrate that together with the pipeline group models, you know, uh, whatever that might be, GAP, okay? You get that to integrate with GAP, and then you get it to integrate with uh, the process uh, calculations of HiSys. Let's say that we finally make it there so we have an integrated model system. So then what do we do? Other than saying we, we, we finally did it, okay? What do we do? Why did we do it? Okay, anybody suggestions about why we would actually want to integrate all these models together? Tack on at the end, converting the products that we create into value, okay, into dollars or crowns, okay? Because that's really what somebody finally at the end of the day in the oil company is going to look at. They're not going to look at all these other models that were used to create the value and the costs. They look at the bottom line, the bottom line, the net present value or whatever, rate of return. Okay, that's another model. That's the economic modeling. Okay, so what would be the natural question that you could try to solve with an integrated model system? Okay, I don't know what what would that be. Yeah. Okay, maximize the net present value or if you have the economics, why not just use net present value instead of maximize the amount of oil produced? Because that is not going to be the same thing. And we'll, we'll see that in case tomorrow that Alex will show you in a gas condensate. If you maximize the total oil recovery, then it's going to say you just keep injecting more of your gas, injecting more of your gas. All the gas you produce, you re-inject re it. Okay? That's, that's the optimal solution. But that is not the optimal net present value solution. So optimizing, maximizing the net present value clearly is, would be a goal. Okay? But then Mike talked about, so that's what? That's our objective function, our target. Okay? So in relation to the last two, two days' discussions, what are the other issues that we want to look at in this integrated model that we've built? Okay, what, what else do we have to define to do the optimization that Robert wants us to do? Boundaries, boundaries like international governmental boundaries or? Okay, uh, try to take that a little bit um, <coughs> Try to take it, put it into a little more specific terms. I mean, we've built, we've got the reservoirs, we've got wells, because we can't produce the reservoirs without the wells. So if we just take, and then we've got the pipelines, and we've got this, up, what do you mean by boundaries? When you, if we just pick a well, okay, what are the boundaries you're talking about for that well? Okay. Okay, but control whole production system. I'm going to be a little bit like Mike, but I'm not as big. You don't have to be afraid of me, you know. Control the production system. I mean, if you say that, you can do that in a presentation to managers and they're all happy, okay? But the people who actually control something, you know, they want to know what do you want me to control? Okay, the driller. Okay, the driller has control over drilling wells. Okay, well, what is it you want to control about the drilling of wells that might affect the net present value? What, what is it we can tell the driller or, or, or take into account when we're looking at the, the drilling? It's the reservoir model. Okay, what do you do when you do a reservoir simulation is you place the wells, right? The well placement. If we have a big reservoir, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer, and we put all 
50 wells in the one northeast corner, right? Then the net present value might be A. And if we put them all in the southwest corner, it might be B and so forth. So the well placement would be something that we're controlling, right? Is that what you meant by... Okay, once it's producing. Yeah. Okay, so then let's go to the separator. Uh, let's go to the process unit, okay, the separator. What could you control there that might improve the net present value in the process mm -hmm. unit? Right. Right. So, so there are there are certain things that that the, the the that can be controlled or changed on the separator. Like Mike was talking about, they, one of the fields they thought about changing the separator pressure in order to get an extension of the life instead of drilling new wells. Because drilling new wells has a certain cost versus changing the separator pressure and adding compression has another cost. And you want to do an evaluation. If I do this, it costs that much. If I do that, it costs that much. And in both cases, you get a new net present value, and you choose the one that gives you the highest net present value, or maybe the most income that particular day. So the deal is that all of these models that we've taken, the process model, uh, the reservoir simulator model, which also includes effect on drilling, which is well placement, all of those models have input to them, right? You can't run the model without an input data deck. Yeah? Within the input to each model, some of the input can be changed and some of it's fixed. Right? So it's basically for all the models, you have to identify at a given point in time, we haven't developed the field. We're looking at evaluating the development of the field. We haven't drilled any wells. The location of wells in the reservoir simulator is a controllable variable, right? That's in today's modeling of the field. We haven't drilled any wells. Then, three years later, we've drilled up the first 15 wells. Now when we do integrated modeling, those 15 well locations, they can't be changed. They're now fixed. You could change the tubing size in those 15 wells. You know, you'd have a cost to change the tubing size and you'd have an impact on the net present value. So you, you get these control, what I call control variables. They're basically numbers in the models which represent something that we can actually change or do in the field, okay? We can actually change the separator pressure, but it costs so much money. So every variable change that you make will have probably an impact on the revenue, yeah? But it also has a what associated with it? If we change the separator pressure, What's associated with that? The rates. Huh? The rates. Yeah, the rates will change, and you'll get uh, more gas, oil, NGLs, water, etc. But we're looking at the, the net present value of this. So we're looking all the way downstream. So we change the separator conditions. We don't change anything else. And, and let's say we get more oil and gas. We get more revenue. Okay? So that affects in a positive way the net present value. But what at the same time was associated with that change in separator pressure? Yeah. Well, because it's an integrated model, if you change the separator pressure, then it might change the, the tubing uh, constraint pressures in the model, and that affects the reservoir performance. It's, it's capturing all of that. Okay? It's supposed to be capturing it because it's an integrated model. So, so all of that's being captured in the modeling. So the reservoir, it's presumably 
if you change the, com the separator pressure, it changes maybe the compression pressure, and it changes the flowing tubing pressures in the wells, and that changes how much gas and oil and water each well produces. Okay, so upstream, it's being handled. Downstream, it's being handled in that we're doing economic modeling at the very end, right? We're getting more gas and oil. We're getting more money. So the net present value is, is going up, right? But I say, no, it doesn't go up. What we do, we change the separator condition, according to what Mike said. We change the separator condition, and our net present value goes down. What happened? I'm getting more oil and gas production. I'm making more money. So why doesn't it have a positive effect on the net present value? Cost a lot of money. The cost side of the economic model. Okay? So most variable changes in an integrated system, okay, you have to bring in all of the effects. Okay? And in this integrated model, when you change the separator pressure, you're obliged to have not just this interconnectivity to the reservoir model through, through all these various models of the, you know, but you also have to have a cost function on the economics model. And that cost function has to be either a continuous or discontinuous function of separator pressure. Okay? Otherwise, we can't do optimization. You can't just look at the upside, the good things that happen when you change a variable. Okay? And so, building an integrated model is requires a lot more than we do today because the economist who looks at separator pressure change today, what they do, the reservoir group changes pressure constraints, they rerun the model, they give a new case. This is the profile we give you with a change in separator pressure, okay? And then later they, they pass those down through emails and, you know, FTP downloads and file conversion trades. And, and then the economics group They'll do a scenario between what it is today and what it is, what it would cost to go to a certain pressure. Okay, so they they have that cost built into the evaluation, and they come back and they say this is a no go. We can't afford to do that change in the separator conditions because it requires new compression, it requires new piping, it requires you know this and that, and all these costs together don't balance. Uh, it's easier to drill three new wells. It's less expensive. They do all of that, and the reservoir engineer doesn't know anything about what the economist is doing. Okay? But if you integrate this model together, and you actually want to launch the model from the reservoir all the way to the economics, then in that integrated model, the economics group has to make available to this integrated... In their economics model, they have to have a dependency, a functional dependency of cost to separator pressure change. And if they don't, the integrated model means nothing. It's not an integrated model. People don't do that today. The economists, they'll run case A and they'll run case B and, you know, and then they'll say, well, you know, yes or no. They don't look for a different separator pressure that might, in fact, be the most economic uh, change in the system. They, they, they don't do that, very likely. Why? Well, they might be able to do something like that, but they, every time they change the separator pressure, they have to ask these three reservoir groups who are tired of doing new cases for something they don't know what's going on, like the evaluation. They have to keep running new cases, and they're tired of running new cases. It takes time. Everybody's busy. You have to do the emails and the FTP downloads and the conversions, and, and it's just a mess. People don't do it because it takes so much time. There's nothing automated in the sense about taking new runs, new forecasts, and bringing it all the way downstream for the economist to look at a new case. That's not been automated. So people do it as seldom as possible. And only for large investment, large considerations, they might they might actually go through the exercise. And it might take them six months or nine months to do it. And what, what we're trying to talk about doing in the future 
is actually having these current models of the entire system and having them continuously updated and integrated together. So they can, with obviously some effort, they can be run in harmony, they can be run as an integrated model, and that you can evaluate the cause and effect of changing key controllable variables. Okay? That's the concept. That's the idea. That's what the industry is not doing today. So that's the topic of what, at least what I call this, integrated model optimization. And I want to just talk about some of the issues around that. Um, Mike, do you have any comments further to, to that? Okay. Now, to do this, instead of just talking for two days about all the issues that I can see, at least, of, of, of the complexities and, and, you know, if you're optimistic, you say, well, we're going to get there, we're going to go to the moon, we're going to do it. The Obama challenge, okay? We're going to do it. John F. Kennedy, we are going to do it and we get to the moon, right? There's that attitude and then you go about doing it, okay? That's my perspective, okay? And then the other perspective is that look at all the obstacles. I mean, give me a break. I mean, we got enough to do today. We don't want to go there. It's too much to do. There are too many obstacles. There are too many problems, okay? So what I'm going to try to do is... is, is kind of bring up both sides. What are the challenges? The upside potential, if you don't see it, then I hope you will by the end of tomorrow. But the upside potential is that the Reservoir A group will actually have a feeling for how their reservoir model controllable variables, what they can, the well placement or the well tubing or other issues in their reservoir model. Does it have any effect at all on the bottom line? And what is that effect? Okay? Because one of the things when you integrate the system you're going to find out is that Reservoir A don't make, it don't make a difference what you do with Reservoir A. But Reservoir B, there you better, you know, you have a big impact if you do this or you do that. Okay? Maybe it's got faults and layers and, and well placement and all sorts of, you're going to start seeing and then you'll find out that the process group what they do, it doesn't matter. This is a low GOR oil, okay? What the process group does if they change the separator pressure has no effect on the bottom line, okay? But the design of the pipeline size and the routing and all that is the absolute most important issue. But that's for this field over here. Another field, so you start identifying what are the variables, what are the components of the system that really have an effect on the bottom line. Uh, the reservoir engineer generally feels like if, if he or she goes to work and they maximize the oil production, they've done their job. Okay, but in a gas cycling case of a gas condensate, that is not that is not what you do, and that's why you don't have every gas condensate field in the world being gas cycled, because if that was the only goal to maximize the amount of condensate you get out of the reservoir, then generally you would do gas cycling, but that's not what we do. We do gas cycling one out of ten reservoirs. So the other advantage of the integrated model approach is that you can, even if you don't do true optimization because of the computational limitations, you start seeing the real cause and effect. You, you actually can make your list of priorities. These are the things that make the biggest impact on bottom line net present value. These are the parts of this integrated system that we're going to spend our money doing engineering, design, uh, sensitivity analysis, these are the areas that we're going we're to prioritize that and we're not going to deal with those things that are second order effects. Okay? That's going to make some people happy and other people unhappy. Okay? Because if you're in the group that it don't matter what you do, you probably want to shift to another field. Okay? Where the reservoir is, is having an impact. Okay? But you can't change it. It's mother nature that made the fact that that reservoir performance is kind of a given. Okay, if it's a big tank, 10 Darcy's, no, frac no, no faults, single layer, okay, then you can just use a tank model. You don't, no matter what you do, well placement don't matter. You know, it, 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 
it, it's, it's a non-issue. The reservoir engineering part of that field development is a total non-issue. The reservoir part. Now, the tubing size, that would be a big issue. Okay? Things like that. Uh, the, the well placement would be an issue because if you have this big high permeability tank, which is the first gas field developed in the North Sea, was the Hewitt Field, Phillips Petroleum Company, okay, and a few other operators. Big tank. And Chevron, whoever it was, they said, well, it's a big field, it's a large area, we're going to put like four or five platforms there. It was, you know, a new development. Four or five platforms back in the 1960s, you know, in the North Sea, the first time ever, we we're talking like a lot of money. And Mike Fetkovich, okay, reservoir engineer, who doesn't like reservoir simulation, <laughs> okay, he said, this is a damn tank. You put all the wells in the middle, you build one platform, and you drain everything from one, basically one platform, and you save bukus of money. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. You have to design. What, what's the effect? What is the reservoir interference effect uh, on the wells? They did the reservoir engineering calculations. Second order effect. Okay? They do the geologic to make sure that there's no hidden faults out there that we don't drain. Okay? They did, the, they did all the analysis, but at the end of the day, the reservoir was a non-issue to that field. It was the tubing size, how many wells, etc. That was for that particular well, that particular field. So you, you, by integrating the system all the way down to the economics, you're able to see f for a given field what's important and what's less important. And we don't really see that today. Okay? We don't see that today. And, and the problem is that we're, we're not, the reservoir groups are not talking about the same um, indicator of importance as the economics group because the, the reservoir engineers don't calculate dollars, right? The reservoir engineers don't know anything about costs. They're talking about maximizing oil production. That's all they know about. But the economists... They don't care if the recovery factor is 32% or 68% or 92%. They don't care at all. All they care about is the net present value. And to get the 92% recovery, if it takes $60 billion and you're only making $30 billion of, it, of revenue, what the hell does it matter if, it, if, you, if you get 92% recovery? They don't care about recovery factor. So their gauge of optimal or their gauge of, 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 of what's important is totally different than the reservoir group. Okay, so so, and the problem is that the people at the top, how do they know what's important or not? They also don't know because they don't see this effect that the reservoir performance doesn't matter. Because you don't translate the reservoir performance into net present value. Okay, somebody says, let's change all the well placement. One of the key things in the reservoir model. Let's change the reservoir well placement. Run three cases. Everything in the middle, everything uniformly distributed, everything in the northeast corner, okay? And if the net present value changes less than 1% for those three cases, what does it tell you? Okay? But they don't do that kind of analysis today. They basically don't do that kind of analysis. They might indirectly see that the recovery doesn't matter, it doesn't change, okay? And the reservoir engineer certainly doesn't know for those three cases that there's a huge economic impact of those three well placement designs. So anyway, that's so so that's what we're gonna try to do. We're gonna first try to to do integrated modeling. Okay. Once we build an integrated model, we're then gonna try to do some kind of optimization to get a feel for um, the cause and effect in a, in a petroleum system. Okay. Any questions? Any, uh... Now, one of the things that you'll quickly find out is that if the reservoir models, three of them, are all taking 10 hours per case to run, okay, and I work with reservoir models that are even more complicated because we do compositional simulation. They might take three days to run, okay? Per case, three days. 
then you can't do hundreds of function calls like yesterday. We, we, how many function calls were we doing? You know, we were launching through the Excel, you know, iteration after iteration. And for Bjarna, he, if it took him three days to get the result, <laughs> okay, his F, if it could took him three days to get his F, okay, and he had ten variables, and every time he wanted to get an F, it, it was costing him three days of, of CPU. You know, he knew he would know that to solve that problem, he would be retired by the time you got to the final solution. He, he wouldn't have the patience even to wait around and run the 300 calls to the function needed to solve the optimal 10 variable problem, okay, with 28 constraints. He's not, it, it's not going to work. So what's the alternative? Well, just don't do it. Do it like we do it today. That's the alternative. Okay, that's the, we don't need to go to the moon today. Okay? We can look at the moon, and that's enough. Build a big telescope, look at it more closely. Okay? We don't need to go there. Or you can say, do I need a reservoir model that takes three days to run to get a first order estimate of what the reservoir performance is? Do we need a three day running model to get that performance? Okay. Can we, with less accuracy, build a reservoir model that takes 30 seconds? Okay. That question has to be answered. And how accurate is accurate enough to get the first order effects? Well, Mike Fetkovich would say for the Hewitt field, you need one cell. Okay, so it's it's 30 microsecond run for the reservoir. Okay, so in that case, he's lucky. You you, you know you can do it. Not 30 seconds, but three microseconds. You can use inval. But in other cases. It might you not might not be able to bring it to 30 seconds, but you probably can bring it to 30 to, to 30 minutes, maybe three minutes, okay, without the same accuracy. So you're going to have to give up something on the accuracy, okay, and then you're going to get these disciplined engineers who are so happy about their three-day runs. I'm not sure why they're happy. Maybe because they can launch it and then they can go have a, a, a team building for three days, okay, and they come back and and the model run is finished. And they can do a new model run, go for a new team building. Okay? If you force them back to 1968, okay, the models that were running then, the, comp the computer models running in 1968, the grid size would run in three seconds today, no matter how complicated. I mean, 1968. Does that mean that the answers we got in 1968 with our first reservoir simulators were not accurate enough? There were just a bunch of yahoos back there. They, they, they were getting answers that really were worthless. I mean, and even worse, Dijkstra and Parsons, okay, the 13 column pads, the years of work done by Dijkstra, Parsons, standing, these people who actually computed with a slide rule, were those answers that just worthless? We need 3 million grid cells. Okay, we need three million variables with, with common filters to, to to get the right answer. That's what we need. Why do we need it? Because we can calculate it today. Okay, but the question is the first order answers that you got in 1968 or 1956. You know, when I was born and the slide rule was truly the the only form of computation. You know, were those first order answers good enough? Or was it just garbage? Was all of the literature before 1960 just worthless? Material balance calculations, IPR, you know, Vogel, all this stuff. Because if you say you need a three-day run to get the first order effects, then you you basically are saying that everything that was done was just garbage. Okay, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case. I think with your three second and your maybe 30 second run, you can get all the first order effects in any problem you give me in petroleum engineering, in reservoir that I know something about. You give me a model with 6,000 grid cells and I'll give you the first order effects. Guaranteed. Okay? 
Now, how to do it, you have to use engineering sense. You have to force yourself, if I've only got 6,000 grid cells, how do I select them? Okay? How do I select them to give me all the first order effects? That is the engineering challenge to make this a real a reality. Okay? You can't use three-day running models at the base. Can't do it. You can do a three-day running model to verify Curtis's 30-second running model that it's first order right. You can do that. You can say how good or bad is Curtis's 30-second model. And you can make a three-day run to say good enough or not. So you can use that kind of detail, that kind of refined first order modeling to verify or to help build that 30 second model run. Okay? So the challenge is turning back time in the way we model, turning back time to capturing the first order effects. And it, it, uh, whether it can all be done automated, I, uh, I don't know. You know, uh, I, I doubt it, but, but the new software development in Reservoir Engineering should be that I've got my 30,000 grid cell model. How can I automatically translate that into a first order correct 3,000 grid cell model? Okay? If you had that kind of software out there, man, you'd be making, you know, that would be the software to develop. Okay? Just to get the first order effects right. I'm not talking about getting the answer right, okay, but to get the cause and effect right. Okay? That's what we're talking about. The other thing is you have to have a time frame for your model. How accurate does it need to be accurate for the next 30 days or for the next 30 years? Okay? Or Michael's looking at a problem the next three days. Okay? The startup of a well. Okay? You don't care about 30 days from now. <laughs> you care about 30 seconds and 30 minutes, three hours, three days. That's all you care about, the startup time of a well. So the model you build only needs to ha handle that part of it. Okay? So the time frame of the models that we build, uh, the, the accuracy and, and so forth is. So there are lots and lots of issues in here. And um, so I think traveling back in time to engineering methods used in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s is the way to go together with the software that we have today that make all those methods so readily available and, and fast. The computers that, are, that calculate Dykes or Parsons. You know, the 13 column pad, you know, the first exam I had, you know, was just calculating numbers. But now all the computational part of it has disappeared. But the methods being used back then still have validity. And if we don't re-embrace those methods, then, then we'll never be able to do this in, in reality. Okay? So we have to simplify our models. Okay. So let's talk about uh, three main issues. We've got modeling. What is modeling? And then the issues of integrating the models. There's lots of, uh, you know, from computer science issues to, to, um, to translation of the gas and oil streams. You know, we generate gas and oil streams from our reservoir simulator, and, and we give those gas and oil streams to HiSys, and HiSys engineer sitting there with his 28 component equation of state saying, what do I do with this gas and oil? <laughs> I want to create four products. I need a compositional stream. So you have to translate from the gas and oil from the reservoir model into a 28 component molar stream. That's a engineering translation. Before the high sys people can do their work, there has to be a, an engineering translation done. That's part of the integration. Sometimes it's needed. Sometimes it's just a file format change. Gas and oil rates straight into Prosper. That's all they need is gas and oil rates. Okay? They don't care about what kind of oil it is. They just want gas and oil rates. And then finally, the optimization. So, <clears throat> so what I'm going to call model, and Mike, I think uh, maybe um, 
will argue that there are other names that are better, but what I call a model. It's some kind of mathematical representation uh, of a physical process, okay? That's what I'm talking about a model, is that you have an equation or a table, you have some mathematical representation. There have to be numbers. That's the main thing, okay? There have to be numbers involved. And it's representing some physical process. And then it has to be implemented in the computer because that's what we're using here is computers. And in any such model, there are going to be parameters um, that will define a particular case that you're looking at. Um, simulator is another term, I think, Mike, that you maybe thought was more appropriate and more consistent with. Uh, um, but I think we don't need to get caught up in the semantics. We're just talking about some kind of mathematical model describing a, a real process. And in that model, there are parameters. And if you change the parameters, you get a different result. Okay? Darcy equation, that's a, a model of flow through porous media, and the parameters are permeability and viscosity. Okay? Pressure, um, length. So the types of models that are out there that we can make use of are, are purely theoretical models, um, first principle models, um, ideal gas law for certain conditions would be considered, I mean, it's it's let's say near exact, there's, there's theoretical uh, basis for them. And then we have empirical, spelled in an interesting way. Empir, no, that's right, I guess. Empirical methods, models. Um, Darcy's law is an empirical model. Okay, Darcy actually just found that uh, velocity through a piece of porous material was proportional with the pressure drop across that, you know, from the inflow to outflow, and it was just proportional, linearly proportional. Uh, Darcy didn't know anything about permeability. He didn't even define permeability because he, he was always flowing water. All he, all he saw was that you just, if you increase the rate to twice, then the pressure drop went twice, okay? So that's empirical in the sense it's experimentally derived, okay? Um, you take observations and you make a correlation of those observations. The standing PVT correlations, those are empirical, okay? Um, the, the ARPS decline curve equations, okay? ARPS was a guy in what, the 1940s, Mike? Yeah. 42? Who, uh, you know, this was before reservoir simulators, and it was when, you know, the banker, you know, some guy come in, wanted to drill a well, and said, you know, I've got this much oil, and I, I think I'm going to have this much oil into the future. And they wanted to forecast into the future how the oil rate would decline in time. And uh, you, you wanted to be able to do it quickly, and preferably graphically, because you didn't have co computers or calculators. So this ARPS guy went to the archives and looked at all the production from wells and from fields, plotted it versus time, and then observed that when, you know, back then in the 30s and 40s, a lot of the fields would produce for a constant because there were regulations. There was an over excess capacity and, and it would be constant for this. But when it went on decline, it went down, okay? And then he fit uh, uh, three equation forms to the different uh, declines that he observed. Uh, exponential, uh, uh, hyperbolic, and, and, um, and um, I don't know what you call it, but basically three equations, harmonic. Okay, not very many harmonic, it's basically hyperbolic and exponential. And with these different models, of which had basically uh, two parameters, uh, basically the exponential has one parameter, and the hyperbolic has two parameters. And with those one or two parameters, he could take any data from any historical field and, and, and fit the production decline from that field or from that well with wonderful accuracy. Okay? Why it went like that, the hyperbolic or the exponential, he didn't know and he didn't care, but it sure as hell fit the data. 
Okay? And then he wrote the paper. The bank started using it. And not until 1970s did Mike Fetkovich come along and say that this falls out if you take a material balance of, of, of an oil, an undersaturated oil, and an undersaturated oil Darcy equation, those are both kind of the ones empirical, uh, you know, constant compressibility expansion of an oil, that's not really empirical, that's thermodynamics, okay? And you, you put these two things together and you take the equations and, he, and you derive analytically, it's an exponential decline. So if you have an undersaturated oil, it's going to fall in exponential decline, period. Okay, that's, so he gave a reasoning, physical reasoning, and if you took a different inflow performance equation, that's not straight line pressure, but it's pressure squared for gas and uh, no longer constant compressibility, but a gas P over Z, you know, material balance. You put those together, you get a hyperbolic equation. And the one constant is, is around 0.3. So, so basically, you move it from the empirical to what you call theoretical. Gave theoretical basis for the empirical equation. He didn't change the equation. He said, yeah, the equations are just fine. But here are the physical quantities. And he gave equations that would allow you to calculate those two constants. Okay? From permeability, skin, volume. And, and he kind of, he moved it. In, in, a, in a different direction, he explained why it was the way it was. But it's still empirical, okay? It's based on observation. But he, uh, he did more of a kind of a... a uh, okay. And then, um, not really in the same category, because uh, uh, ARP's equation is an equation-based uh, uh, model. But if you have an explicit equation for something, that's great, okay? Because that can be computed in microseconds, right? There's no iteration, maybe, and it's straight calculation. Okay, graphical. This is more difficult uh, to to use in a in a computing environment. Graphical can be translated to tables, table lookup, linear interpolation. You're there. Okay, that's an alternative. You don't need an equation. In fact, uh, Vidar, who we ran off the first day of the first hour, uh, Bjarne is a PhD student. He's doing all of this high-level optimization, I mean, of very, very complicated problems in the tool field, you know, the stuff we're talking about yesterday with the routing and, and complicated flow and pipe for gas, oil, and water, and IPR, and God knows what. And he translates it all into a bunch of linear table, table linear interpolation, just a bunch of multidimensional tables, everything. All of the models are reduced to a bunch of tables. Interpolated linearly, and then he solves that problem in a very apparently fast, efficient, elegant way. Okay, now the tables are maybe created by very complex models, so he's making an effort to replace the three-day run that we don't want to have with a bunch of tables. Okay, in a sense, that that's what. He, of course, his problem he's not looking over a thirty-year horizon either. So, but basically, you've got. Uh, uh, graphical integer problems. Talked about that yesterday. Um, and um, mixed integer also talked about that yesterday. Tabular, piecewise linear. And, and then there's, um, Mike, you might want to, I think, talk about this next slide. Um, I guess as, as I read it, you have models, yeah. Well, basically, we have models that, I mean, mechanistic models. I mean, you have physics behind them, and let's say material balance is a mechanistic. Yeah? Basically, you, you have the physics, and uh, then you have, uh, when I talk to Bjarne Foss, he I don't need the model. I, I, I start to, to run something, and gradually what is in the model will kind of emerge on its own. So we have basically two types, uh, we kind of map, map it. That's a mechanistic presentation, a model that have more and more mechanistic, okay? and you have more, uh, in, uh, and you have models which are basically built on uh, information. Let's say in, uh, in offshore uh, Sarawak, Shell developed uh, 
program to model the behavior of the field, measure the well pressure, and there is no model behind it. We just over time manage to find some trends in the system and they use it to tune and optimize the, uh, tune and optimize the field. So within that domain, you have a kind of sub-domain. The first thing that we have is what we call this uh, fuzzy model. Fuzzy model have some mechanistic in them and they have some information in them. But basically, you don't get an absolute quantitative number. So, well, this is better than the other, this is quicker than the other. You have some uh, semantics, say, good, bad, excellent, uh, very bad. And uh, the control engineers develop, in fact, on, based on fuzzy model, they develop a very uh, a big body of control based on fuzzy. And unfortunately, or fortunately, in some of the oil, in the oil field, in many cases, you go to a production engineer and say, please rank you well, and say, these are the good, these are the better, these are the excellent, this son of which I don't want to touch. So that, that's the ranking, and they work with it. So we have that, a uh, little bit mechanistic, a little bit information. Then we have the gray box, uh, the gray box model, uh, and these are models that you have kind of a mixture, some mechanistic, but you don't understand everything very good, like the first generation, of uh, multi-phase uh, flows using drift flux. People invented some concept, drift flux, that means the, the average flow velocity of each phase compared to some uh, average number that they, and, and according to that, they managed to express the slippage and the real behavior. So that kind of a gray box, you have more mechanistic, you have a little bit of information based on observation. Then you have the linear uh, black box and the control engineers dealing quite a lot of those. They basically have a box. They don't know what is in there. They run a process for model identification. They manage to identify the model without really knowing it. They just identify. That's the way control engineers are working. They get a box. You put input. You read the output. Even if you don't know the differential equation, but you know that it's kind of a linear, you can basically do model identification. You can identify the model by, you know, we try to do it in well testing analysis. We give a step function with, uh, in rate. We try to find out how the pressure in the well is following it. We figure out we know something about the equation and we develop a model of our well. Okay, so that is kind of a linear black model. And then we have this uh, neural net it's just an example of category of basically you can train every uh, every system uh, to uh, basically you can generate by seeing the results you can basically generate an understanding how that system behaves without understanding okay you you can basically take any black bo black box and train it to behave the way you want the, the way your model uh, behave without really understanding so these are the things that the control engineers are using. We are not experts in that, but maybe some of you are related to the control engineers, and they say, you know, we don't have to know the model. The model will show itself. Okay? So we manage to compose it afterward. We start to listen to the music, and then we can just extrapolate this, uh, this uh, opera of, uh, of Mozart because we already managed to capture the pattern. Then we go to the right. We have more and more accurate modeling, and that's what happened, for example, in the multi-phase flow. <coughs> as long as the wells were vertical, they managed empirically on the black box, they managed to find out very good and very accurate equation. When it was horizontal, they managed to find a very good correlation without really understanding the physics. Once they start to tilt it with one degree, all the correlation that had went into part, and they realized they need different approach. Now we have to understand the forces between the phases, they came with the two fluid model, three fluid model, and tried to put the basic fluid mechanic rules to each one of the phases. So that we move to the right. I made that bet really when the petroleum engineers talking to the control engineers, they have to clarify what we are dealing with. And one of my worries um, dealing with production engineering is we do have too much of fuzzy models. We go to the field, we go to the friends of the uh, are in the field and they can tell you these wells don't touch them, these are bad. This well, ultimo, you know, everything that we do, the well really 
and we use that well to, to cover all the bad other all the other bad thing in the field. And that's not very quantity, kind of uh, emotional, but it is represented behavior. So I think if we have to mix a model which is very much on the white box quantity with the fuzzy, we have a problem. And that's in reality what we come, uh, the, what we have in the field. We try to teach people the dealing with fuzzy concept, to teach them to quantify. It's not very easy. And we tell them if you rent a well, one give 200 and one give 400 instead of giving bad and good, you get more information. But we are still dealing with it. So that map uh, is supposed to give you that it's kind of a more complex domain uh, when we are talking about models and mm. just <coughs> information to keep in the back of your mind. Now one of the things that I, uh, you know, when if, if you talk about uh, at least the models I'm familiar with, um, anything, if you have a model um, that uh, is um, uh, how should I put it? Uh, if, if you have a model with with many parameters that 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 really describes the physics and, and everything, okay, it's like a reservoir simulator. It's all the equations are as advanced as you can get them. You have you know a million grid cells, so you potentially have lots of resolution in your geologic description, and you have you know the material balance is there. Maybe it's compositional, so you have this this deluxe model with 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 a huge amount of representation of the physical process. Okay, but million grid cells. But if you say that that model is useful or not useful, the only way it's going to be a useful model, even though you have all of the physics built in, all of the, is if you have data. Okay, if you have data to populate the million times 10 parameters that go into that million grid cell problem. Okay, you have a million times 10. You have to have permeability in three directions, porosity, relative permeability. You have, you know, you've got more than 10, but I'm just saying 10. And you've got a million cells to fill. And you've got, for each cell, you've got to fill it with 10 numbers or 100 numbers. Now, so in and of itself, uh, something far, far, far to the right, let's put it over here, but with no data, okay, little data, I would consider this a worthless model. Absolutely worthless. We agree? But if you take and you make all sorts of, you drill 600 wells and you do PLT logging and you do all of them, you put a staff of 300 to populate and to do all sorts of geologic studies and you do relative permeability and you do all these things and then you move that model up by adding data, right? And refining the data and then you put the wells on production and you refine it even more based on not just static pre-production data, but you add more production data. So you, you crawl up this here, okay, and you finally reach here. There you have a model that's worth something. Now, it may be at the end of the life of the field, <laughs> okay? But let's say that you're 10 years into the field. You've done history matching everything. This model is valuable. Why is it valuable? Why? You see what we've done. You, you agree, Mike? We've got all the physics we could ever dream of. We've added uh, uh, static data. Here we start getting production data. Okay, this is static data. And we move up. So after 10 years, we're here. Now that model runs three, three days. You know, with a 60 processor computer. It's a million grid cells, compositional. What good is that model to us? Why, why do, what can we do with that model? I mean, what's its value to us? I and mean, why, why did we build it? Why did we spend all the money getting the data? History matching. For what purpose? What, what, what's the purpose? 
to predict the future, right? To predict the future. That's the only... It's, it's going into a realm of time, a realm of new wells being drilled, into a space, a time... Uh, it's going into a new space. It's extrapolation. Okay, that's what it's doing. It's extrapolating into time. And the comfort level of doing that extrapolation is high. I have a high comfort level with this model because of all of all of the physics being added, all of the data, refinement. So I have, in a sense, reduced the uncertainty of my forecast for the next 20 years, right? And in the context of what we're talking about here, the 20-year forecast can be done with such a model that costs us $60 million to build, it takes three days to run, on a computer that costs $3 million, okay? We have more certainty in our belief of that 20-year forecast than if we hire Mike Vetkovich to come in here and he'll do decline curve analysis forecasting for the next 20 years based on his experience level. Okay? Those are two alternatives. Okay? So all this model is providing to us is a means to forecast the future. Now the question is, do we need to run the 20, this model here that takes three days to run? Do we need, in the context of an integrated modeling system, do we need to actually run that model into the future? And how many times do we need to run it into the future? Okay, Can we run it into the future for 16 cases? Okay which change various variables. And we just make those 16 runs and we, we tabulate the results. Okay? Or we correlate the results with simplified models. Okay? So what we could do with that model is that we could create our own additional data with that model. We look at different scenarios. Okay, different future scenarios, adding wells, changing constraints, doing all these things. And instead of waiting for the future to tell us what the data are, right? We say the model is going to give us the truth of what would happen if we do this or that. But it's not necessary to actually, my argument is that you've now got a model you can make a few cases. You can make a few 20-year runs. Okay? And make the assessments out of that of what kind of simplified model do I need to do the forecasting in the context of an integrated modeling system where I want three-minute runs or 30-second runs. So what you do is that you actually can create additional data. It's what we do with our PVT model. We build these exorbitant, complicated, you know, 35 component equation of state models, okay, for a given uh, pressure composition space that we describe from data. And then we start using that model to forecast outside the measured data, okay? So we, we can use these models that are created, these very far out to the right, up here, in my opinion, use those models to create a synthetic database which we then empiricize either into multidimensional tables or ARPS equations or whatever method you want to use. Those models then will represent the 16 simulations we make, three days each. Those, that simplified model will then represent all of those 16 cases with reasonable accuracy and pre presumably uh, simulations in between those 16, changes of variables. And now we've created, uh, we've created a machine to help develop an empirical model. That's, that's one approach to, to, to taking this, um, uh, this model. But if you start down here, 
generating cases, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not going to work because there's an infinite amount of uncertainty with this model here. There is no data. There's an infinite number of uncertainty. Of, of, of the, that model is totally worthless. Now, when we get to this point before production and this point, we can do the same kind of thing. We can make forecasts before we actually get production data. Many, many cases, many runs, but with a greater deal of uncertainty. And we can use those cases to build simpler models. So I'm a strong that's, advocate. That's, by the way, that's what the control engineer calling the reduced model. It's yeah. a big environment and discipline, how to take a big model and operate. So we have it, the reduced here we have on the domain. I'm yeah. not sure it exactly could come in the right place. Yeah. But that reduced model, that's what you're talking Reduce. Well, I don't know what kind of model. because it, but, but my point is that you, if, you, if you're at a point in the, on this curve, somewhere where you're starting to get confidence in the model okay then you can take and use that model to create a synthetic database information to help create simpler models but that cover a wide range that that I'm sure they call that somewhere but we in our industry don't do that very much we don't do it very much but that's something I think that we can we can look at doing um, so that was the one comment I had in, in this. The other comment is that let's take the ARPS decline curve equation as a model. That's a model, right? Now, in the 40s, when ARPS came with the equation, okay, it was here. Right? There was no theory at all. It was just a best fit equation. Better than a polynomial, but okay. In this case, we had a high degree of comfort using that equation. The banks loaned a lot of money. <laughs> okay, they loaned a lot of money based on this, on this equation. Why? Because he was far. You know, the first day he started, he only had three fields, and he he kept building, and he got more and more confidence in this equation, and that's where we ended up with ARPS. But then the question is, where does this move when Fetkovich explains? why the ARPS equation is the way it is. Okay? It moves, I don't know, wherever you want to move it. It moves, basically he explained everything. I mean, I mean, I would say we move it very far over here. So this is the Fetkovich version of the same equation that ARPS proposed here. It's identical equation. Okay? It's an identical equation. It's probably going to this compound parameter, you know, to the left because this material balance is kind of a compound of a lot of 300,000 cells into one cell. Yeah, so it, it moves somewhere. I mean, the point is that this, th what I'm saying is that the, the value of that equation is identical. But, in, in terms of it's, it's the same equation, I mean, you know, but now what you have built here through the Fetkovich is that there's two things. One, I have to change this so you can read it. One is confidence okay and two it's the ability to a priori time zero with static data only predict the the constants in the ARPS equation okay so you can predict the equation constants the old way the ARPS equation was used, you had to have historical data to fit it. You couldn't just say, oh, I've got this well, I'm going to just, okay. You, you, you couldn't do that. But what it allowed is that if you get static data like permeability, skin, volumes, and so forth, pre-production data, that you could actually calculate the ARPS constants from the Fetkovich equations. So it gave us an added confidence that there is some physics to it, that it, you know, and it gives us the ability to use the equation at an earlier stage in the life. So, still it's the same equation, the same model. But it's, it's represented in two different positions here. Um, that was the, um, I think that was uh, the, the um,
So I, so I think that, in a sense, movement in basically movement. Um, Movement in this direction where there's data, okay, in general, it gives us a model that can be used more accurately to predict the future, okay, the more data you have, whether it's purely empirical or founded on all sorts of equations. Then basically the more data you have that in a sense verifies or tunes the model the less uncertainty you have in using that model to predict new scenarios. What we're talking about in integrated modeling is the ability to change things, look at new cases, and see what happens. So the more and more confidence you have in your model's ability to do that, the more you can rely on the results. So that's why data acquisition, using data to tune a model, uh, and so forth, is important. Okay, And if we're starting down here where we don't really have any data at all, of course the uncertainty is so large that uh, you know, integrated modeling, you can't do optimization. All you can do is sensitivity studies. You can change the reservoir volume a factor of 10 okay? because there's this hot spot on the seismic. Okay? And the volume of the reservoir could be from 1 to 10 in size. So it becomes a sensitivity analysis. And you change the volume and you get different net present value, of course. That's not optimization. That's just statistical sensitivity. Okay? You drill the well, you get a permeability. Okay? One Darcy. Okay? Then you can start doing forecasts more reliably because you're not because now you know some petrophysical property. But of course you realize there's a chance that the next ten wells you drill could all have hundred millidarcy instead of that one <laughs> you got the one well that had a Darcy sand. So there's still uncertainty, but you're reducing the uncertainty as you move up in models that are based on more and more data. And that, of course, is, is important, reducing uncertainty. Now, what you can get is a model with a little bit of data and a lot of physics probably is as reliable as a model with a lot of data with very little physics. Okay? You feel you need more data with a purely empirical model to feel confidence in that model, right? But if you have something with well-founded physics, then you maybe need less data to feel confidence in using it. Okay? Okay. That's that's all the, the comments I, I think I had on this on this kind of. Uh... Okay, I think we take a break now and then. Um... But why is the memo we speak?